the history that we were all taught growing up is wrong. My name is Scott Walter, and I'm a forensic geologist. There's a hidden history in this country that nobody knows about. There are pyramids here, chambers, tombs, inscriptions. They're all over this country. We're gonna investigate these artifacts and sites, and we're gonna get to the truth. Sometimes history isn't what we've been told. The Big Apple. Out of the eight million people that live in this city, I wonder how many of them stop to think about the history all around them. Wall Street is named after a barricade that used to be there, one built by Dutch settlers in 1624 to keep the English out. Back then, Manhattan was actually called New Amsterdam until the English finally broke through and gained complete control of the island, renaming it New York. Clues to the past are hidden amongst the skyscrapers, subways, and street signs. I'm here because one New Yorker says she's discovered a mystery right in Central Park. A centuries-old tie between this modern city in ancient Egypt. That's a beautiful pendant. You must be Dorothy. Yes, I am. Thank you. It's wonderful to see you, Scott. Here, sit down and let's talk. Do you know what this is? I think so. That's a cartouche, and those symbols are Egyptian hieroglyphics. Cartouches are basically a rounded vertical oval shape that typically has the name of an Egyptian pharaoh. And they were often carved into stone and found inside the tombs of many of these pharaohs. And for archeologists, they're very important because they can use them for dating. I don't think I know who that is, but I'll bet you do. It's Tuthmosis III. He actually was one of the greatest pharaohs in Egypt because he expanded Egypt to its greatest size ever. And I did some research, and lo and behold, I found out that there's a monument in Central Park with this cartouche. Really? Yes. Here in Central Park? Here in Central Park. Why don't we go and take a look? Sounds great. So your monument, it's an obelisk. Many people in the city of New York and elsewhere don't even know that there is an Egyptian obelisk here. So is this a real Egyptian obelisk? Yes, it is known as Cleopatra's Needle. It's covered in scaffolding. What's that all about? Well, what happened was about two and a half years ago, an associate and I, we sent some photographs of the obelisk in its current condition to the head of uh, the Supreme Council of Antiquities in Egypt. So what exactly were you concerned about? We saw some cracks. The hieroglyphs were eroded. We were concerned that this was a condition that was going to continue unless some attention was paid to it. All you have to do is look at it. You can see that the corners at the base are very degraded. And on the second level of scaffolding, you can't even see the hieroglyphics. And even though this thing is a granite, which is generally a very hard and durable rock, in a climate like New York with many freeze-thaw cycles, if you don't take care of it, it's going to fall apart. That's right. You mentioned something about that cartouche being on here. Since the scaffolding is up there, we really can't see it. So I do have some photos here okay. that you can uh, see the cartouche right there. So we know that this is the cartouche for Tutmosis III. That's correct. But what does the rest of the hieroglyphics say on this obelisk? What it generally says is that Tutmosis was a great pharaoh and that he extends his gratitude to Amun-Ra for wow. his greatness. Amun-Ra, that's the sun god. Yes the most important god of all of Egypt. 
for the simple reason that without the sun, there would be nothing. That's I right, mean, and they understood that energy. Sure. During the time of Tuthmosis, the top of the pyramid, what's called the capstone, would have been covered in gold. And that would have radiated all over. And uh, there were actually were over 100 obelisks. And these all would have been lighting up all of uh, ancient Egypt. When Dorothy mentioned there were more obelisks like this and that some were capped in gold, I remembered one I saw on a recent vacation in Paris. The obelisk of Luxor is located at the Place de la Concorde, which means place of peace. This obelisk was erected to symbolize peace and placed at the spot where a guillotine used to stand. The same guillotine used to kill King Louis XVI and Marie Antoinette. The placement of this obelisk is very significant to Paris's history. But now I'm wondering if the placement of New York's obelisk also has meaning. When I look at this obelisk here that came from Egypt, my question is, why here? Why did they place it at this spot in Central Park? It's no accident that the obelisk is here. I don't think it's an accident either. How long has it been here in the park? It's been here for 135 years, since the 1880s. It's 3,500 years old. That's 1,500 years before Jesus' time. That's correct. Tuthmosis had two of them made. The other one is in London, and they were outside of his temple in Heliopolis. Heliopolis was the Harvard of ancient Egypt. It's where all the important pharaohs went to school. They learned what are known as the ancient mysteries, lessons we now call the seven classic arts and sciences, which included mathematics, geometry, and astronomy. Today, all that's left of Heliopolis are ruins in Cairo, an obelisk in London, and this obelisk in New York City. So this obelisk here in Central Park, how did it get over here from Egypt? Well, it's a really interesting story, Scott. Uh, the New York Masons, from the transporting to the paying to the actual erecting, they're responsible for the obelisk being here. So they were involved from start to finish. End to end, yes. The Freemasons, interesting. And 9,000 of them marched up Fifth Avenue in full regalia. Really? Yes, and I have some pictures here that you can see. This is a big group. They've got their Masonic aprons. This was important to them. But that begs the question uh, for me, why would the modern Freemasons be at a cornerstone laying ceremony for an Egyptian obelisk? Because the Freemason that went to Alexandria in Egypt found artifacts inside the foundation stone that link right to Masonic symbols. Wait a minute, you're saying these are tangible artifacts that connect directly to Freemasonry? Yes. Now, a lot of people believe that modern Freemasonry started in 1717, but is there a connection going back to ancient Egypt? The symbolism of obelisks in Egypt are very important but also the placement geographically, where they put them is also important. And I'm wondering, why did they put this particular obelisk right here in this spot in Central Park? You know, Dorothy, I don't think it's an accident. I'm gonna find out why. New York is one of America's oldest cities, but there's something inside Central Park that's much, much older than the United States. I was surprised to learn that there's an ancient Egyptian obelisk here, and more surprised to hear that artifacts tied to Freemasonry were found under it at its original location in Egypt. That doesn't make any sense. Since modern Freemasonry didn't get started until 3,000 years after this obelisk was finished. That is, unless there was a form of Freemasonry that existed much earlier. This could mean that the men who built the pyramids were intimately tied to the men who built this country. I have a lot of questions about the obelisk. What were the Masonic artifacts found underneath it? Is there a reason the obelisk was placed in Central Park? Could this New York connection to ancient Egypt redefine the history of our country? 
Hi, Jan. How you doing? Doing fine. Good. I just came from Central Park and I looked at the obelisk. Yeah. Well, I'm wondering if you could do a little research and see if you can find anything out about the geographic location of that obelisk. You know, I just don't think it's a coincidence that they put it at that spot in Central Park. Sure, I can do that. That'd be great. Hey, there's one more thing. Do you remember that Freemason that we met in New York? What was his name? Uh, yeah, Brendan Green. Brendan Green, that's it, okay. Thanks for that. Let me know what you find out. Okay, bye, honey. Bye-bye. Good news. I heard back from Brendan. We're gonna meet up in Brooklyn later this afternoon. Hey, Brendan, good to see you again. God, how are you? Hey, I was just in Central Park, and I saw the ancient Egyptian obelisk that was brought here uh, back in the 1800s. And one of the things I learned is that the Freemasons were involved in getting it over here from Egypt. And you being a New York Freemason, I thought, who better to ask? Absolutely. It was brought over here by a fellow brother, Henry Honeychurch Garinge, who, of course, is a Freemason. It was a Herculean task, weighs over 200 tons, and it's about 70 feet tall. Henry Honeychurch Garinge was a Civil War veteran and a lieutenant in the United States Navy. He arranged a furlough just so he could lead the effort to bring the obelisk from Egypt to New York Central Park. Why don't we walk over here to Lady Liberty for a comparison? Okay. Well, there she is, Lady Liberty. I never, uh, never get tired of looking at her. Likewise. You know, some differences. The obelisk is 70 feet and Lady Liberty is 305 feet. Liberty was sent here in over 200 cartons. Meanwhile, the obelisk was sent here in one piece. You know, that's amazing. Think about it, 200 crates, and then she was assembled, and the obelisk was brought over in one piece. Around 96th Street, they had built the trestle bridge, and it was only used for that one time. Just for the obelisk Just for to that. get it exactly. to Central Park. Exactly right. Wow. So there was a lot of money spent. A little over $100,000, and William H. Vanderbilt funded the entire thing. The Vanderbilt family, they were the ones that made their money uh, in the railroad business. When Cornelius Vanderbilt died, he left his son William $100 million. That would be worth $2 billion in today's dollars. Today, there are still a couple Vanderbilts in the public eye. Fashion designer Gloria Vanderbilt and her son, journalist Anderson Cooper. But the question is, why would a family founded by railroad tycoons pay a fortune to bring this obelisk to America. So that begs a question. Do we know if William Vanderbilt was a Freemason? There are many that speculate that he was, but it's an unanswered question. But his father was, right? From what we're told, yes. You know, ironically enough, most of the famous Freemasons are publicly known. But some of them, when you start searching and looking for it, they kind of don't show up. You know, Brendan, when you think about this, to bring a 200-ton massive piece of stone over from Egypt here to America. That was an engineering marvel that Garinj did and involved some pretty fantastic elements of geometry and mathematics. And these concepts were very important to the ancient Egyptians, of course, and to modern Freemasons. Exactly right. So how did they get these two obelisks to England and the US? Well, here, let me show you. This is the transportation of the England obelisk. Well, Freemason John Dixon, who was an engineer by trade, designed this submarine-like vessel. This vessel was actually towed behind a much bigger ship. A storm hit them in the middle of the, of the voyage, and this sunk to the bottom of the Biscayne Bay. You're kidding. How did they get it up? The towing ship Olga had to come back and save them, and six sailors were lost. Really? Absolutely, yes. How long did it take for them to get this up? It sank to the bottom, Within right? four to five days after that happened. It's amazing that it even survived. So how'd they get the American obelisk over here? Honeychurch Garinge actually bored a hole through his vessel 
because the obelisk was too long to fit within it. Then they back welded around the encasement of it, okay. and they transported that all the way across the Atlantic Ocean. So the obelisk was sticking out the front of the ship. Absolutely. Brendan, this is really an incredible story. Egypt allows two important obelisks standing in the front of the temple at Heliopolis, one to go to England, one to come to the United States. But if you stop and think about it, this was one of the most amazing engineering feats of the time. Ancient Egyptians not only developed the first forms of writing, but were also instrumental in the way we use medicine and mathematics today. A 3,500-year-old obelisk being restored in Central Park has set me on a journey to find out if the Freemasons, a secret order that was largely responsible for establishing America, could have existed during the time of the pharaohs in ancient Egypt. If this is true, then it's possible that one of America's most powerful cities could have roots stretching all the way back to the ancient pyramids of Giza. You know, Brendan, one of the interesting things that Dorothy told me is that when the New York obelisk was uh, taken out of its original place in Egypt, they found artifacts underneath it that some say might be connected to Freemasonry. Do you know anything about that? Yes, sir. In fact, Henry Gringe himself found those artifacts. Oh, really? Yeah, and he had to call on the Grand Lodge of Egypt to come out and validate that these were Freemasonic symbols and tools that he found. So they verified that these artifacts were absolutely legitimate. Exactly right. What were these artifacts? One was a builder's square, one was a trowel, and the other was a lead lime plum. Okay. I have some examples of that here for you. As Brendan and I spoke more, he revealed the significance of the artifacts to Freemasons, a trowel to spread the mortar that symbolically binds the Brotherhood together. A builder's square and lead plumb line are reminders to square their actions towards what is honest and true. But versions of these physical tools were also used to build the pyramids in Egypt. Archaeologists have discovered that the pyramids were not built by slaves, as many people think, but by master architects. These men were experts in stone masonry, and upon their death were buried ceremoniously. Their bodies would be entombed in the fetal position, with their heads pointing toward the setting sun. But the question remains, were the ideals of the master architects and ancient pharaohs also buried in ancient Egypt, or were they brought here? to the United States. Let's talk about the obelisk for a second itself. I've learned a little bit about the symbolism of it. It's a phallic symbol. It's also representing a ray of the sun. And essentially, it's also a sundial. So really, there are aspects of astronomy here that are connected to the obelisk, and of course, Astronomy is important to Freemasonry, is it not? It's one of our seven arts and sciences. When you think about it, at the top of an obelisk, what you have is really a pyramid, right? Yes, sir. You know, that reminds me of something. We all see this every day, for that matter. On the back of a dollar bill, we have a pyramid. Mm -hmm. Now, the thing that I'm not really clear on is why is it that the top is separated from the rest of the pyramid, and why is there an eye in the middle? Masons would say, some masons, that the eye is the all-seeing eye or the eye of providence. But the unfinished capping stone represents an unfinished work. This is a symbol that the work of America it's is never yet. done. Never done. Like the pyramid, I think the all-seeing eye is a symbol that may have Egyptian origins. I think it's connected to the eye of Horus, which was an ancient Egyptian symbol that stood for protection, royal power, and good health. So if this all-seeing eye here represents the eye of Horus, in essence, the eye of God or the eye of the sun, that takes us back to Egypt as well. It's 100% correct. You know, as I think about this obelisk in Central Park, 
Do you think that the placement of it in Central Park at that spot has some type of meaning? I would say absolutely. I would also venture to say it's not by any coincidence at all. I know a lot more after talking to Brendan. Trouble is, he took a vow of secrecy when he joined the Freemasons. And that vow prevents him from telling me any more about the specific placement of the obelisk in Central Park. This investigation reminds me of another American obelisk connected to the Freemasons, the Washington Monument. When I was in DC investigating secrets about the city's design, the Washington Monument was also under restoration. I found out that the city was laid out in accordance with a precise plan dictated by Freemason George Washington to an architect named Pierre L'Enfant. Structures like the Washington Monument and the White House were designed by Freemasons and were placed in very specific spots which create alignments and Masonic symbols when seen from above. I feel like the obelisk the Masons placed here in New York must be part of something bigger as well. But what? Hi, Jan. What's up? Well, I think I found something really interesting. Oh, yeah? What's that? You remember that William Vanderbilt paid for the obelisk to come to New York? I do. He was also the one who got to decide where to place it once it got there. Oh, really? I haven't figured out why he chose Central Park yet, but I did find something else. What's that? The Vanderbilt family was responsible for building Grand Central Station. Really? Yes, and there's something in there that's amazing. The ceiling has a mural painted on it that's huge, and it seems to have something to do with astronomy. When I heard there was an Egyptian artifact I needed to check out in New York City, I assumed it was something sitting in a museum. Instead, it was a real Egyptian obelisk standing inside Central Park, brought here by the Freemasons. The obelisk has eroded over time. It's being restored today. But I think the obelisk's secrets have eroded too. Not only could this monument prove that aspects of Freemasonry existed during the times of the ancient pharaohs in Egypt, but it could also reveal an unexplored history of New York City. I'm trying to figure out why William H. Vanderbilt, one of the wealthiest men in America during the 1800s, would have placed this obelisk in Central Park, a desolate part of Manhattan at the time. Oddly enough, the Vanderbilts were also instrumental in building another New York landmark, Grand Central Station. My wife says that our next clue in this Masonic mystery could be on Grand Central ceiling. Half a million people walk through here every day, but hardly anyone ever looks up. On the ceiling are astronomical constellations similar to the night sky. but the ones here are not quite right. All of them appear to be reversed, like Pegasus, the winged horse. Orion the hunter also appears to be reversed, but if you look closely, you see that the stars in his belt are actually in the right position, even though he's facing in a different direction. It's almost like I'm looking at the view God would have from above but it's like Orion is calling out to us here on Earth. Why? Hi, Scott. I found some additional information online that actually points to two other obelisks in New York that may be related to the one in Central Park. 
both seem to have Masonic connections. I hope this helps. Janet. Janet's email pointed out two more obelisks. The first is at the corner of Broadway and Fulton Street in the cemetery of an old church. There also seems to be another at the corner of Broadway and Fifth Avenue. I gotta check out these other obelisk sites, and I bet Dorothy will wanna join me. Dorothy, I'm so yes. glad you came. St. Paul's Church is one of the oldest churches in New York City. My wife, Janet, sent me an email. What she found on Google Earth is that there are three obelisks. You remember we started up at Central Park with Cleopatra's Needle? Absolutely. Well, there are two more obelisks in New York City, and they appear to line up. The second one is right here at St. Paul's Church. Oh, that's amazing. It's weird to see an obelisk rising up in the middle of a church cemetery. The monument honors Thomas Addis Emmett, an immigrant who was exiled from Ireland and made himself an American success. He wasn't a Freemason, but there is someone else at this church who was. And I think Freemasonry is what connects this obelisk to the one in Central Park. Recognize that face? George <laughs> yes, Washington. George Washington. This is where he attended church. When he became president, this was where he prayed. And after his inauguration, just a couple blocks down the street, he came here to pray. Yes. So there's obviously some very strong Masonic connections here. And there's another person that you might find very curious that has a connection to St. Paul's Church here, Pierre Lafont, the one oh, who designed Washington, Washington. DC. Yes. He also yes. designed parts of this church as well. He was a Mason for sure. Oh, absolutely. So there are strong connections here with Freemason. You know, there's one more obelisk. And if you have some time, I'd love to have you come with me and we'll go take a look at that last one. Well, let's go. Let's grab a cab. Today, an ancient Egyptian obelisk sits in New York City's Central Park. Out of the 40 million people who visit the park each year, I bet few of them know that this obelisk is actually part of a series of obelisks that may tie Freemasonry to the ancient Egyptians. Both groups use mathematics, geometry, and astronomy to track the movements of the heavenly bodies. But history says that both groups were also separated by nearly 3,000 years and couldn't have had contact. If the Freemasons did in fact carry on traditions from the ancient Egyptians, this could mean that many of our country's oldest cities, including this one, could have hidden alignments, cryptic symbols, and a forgotten history that stretched back to 1400 BC. Dorothy, I wanna show you something I think you're gonna find interesting. Take a look at this picture. See these three points? Yes. This first point you'll recognize, that's where the Egyptian obelisk was, that you know so well. The second point is St. Paul's Chapel. Now, where we're going is to a third obelisk. Look at how they form a line. That's stunning. And I don't think it's a coincidence, do you? No, no, no. not at all. This third obelisk is really interesting because this is an obelisk which is a monument to General William Worth. I'm sure he was a Mason. Here you see him. If you take a look at the blanket on the horse, 
see the five-pointed star? I think that's confirmation that he was indeed a Freemason. There's another thing, Dorothy, that's very surprising. Worth's body is buried at the obelisk. Well, that's, that's highly unusual to have someone buried in the middle of Manhattan. It really is. My understanding is, is that the obelisk is right near the Flatiron Building, so we have to be looking for that. There it is. All right. right. There. As long as I've been in New York City, I've never noticed it. Well, you know, this General Worth is an interesting character. He was assigned to be the Secretary of War in Texas. So you've heard of Fort Worth, Texas, right? Absolutely. Well, now you know why it's named that. Why is he buried here? Why isn't he buried in Fort Worth? That's a good question. And the reason is he's a native New Yorker. Ah, well, there you go. OK, Dorothy, let's think about this for a second. We've got three points on our line. The first one that was put down was St. Paul's Church. And this is significant to Freemasons because at St. Paul's Church, this is where George Washington prayed and LaFont had a hand in its design. That's now correct, the, yes. Now, the second one that was put down is the Worth Obelisk. General Worth was a Freemason. And the last one to be put down is the real Egyptian obelisk connected to Freemasonry without question because you had 9,000 Freemasons that traveled right up Fifth Avenue here, walked right by the Worth Obelisk to Central Park for that ceremony. That's correct. I assumed that these three were in a line, a straight line. And when I looked at it closely, they're not straight. There's a little bit of a jog here. The question is, why? And to your point, all of this area did not have all of these buildings, so it would have been very easy for surveyors to make a straight line from Central Park all the way down to St. Paul's, and they didn't. Back in those days, almost all the surveyors were Freemasons, and if they wanted to make a straight line, that would be no problem for them. But because this is not, there has to be a reason for that. Alignments have always been very important to people. Freemasons, the Egyptians, and even modern New Yorkers. Twice a year, the setting sun lines up perfectly with Manhattan's east-west streets, a phenomenon that locals call Manhattan Hinge, which is supposed to happen today. The reality is that it happens in any city laid out on a grid. But New Yorkers have really embraced the event. I can't believe how early photographers line up to get a good spot on the Tudor City Bridge over 42nd Street. Some of these guys have been here since noon. Trouble is, there are some clouds on the horizon. Despite the weather, people are everywhere hoping to get a glimpse, hoping for a break in the clouds. It's not going to happen. This is what Manhattan Hinge looks like when clouds don't get in the way. The star we can't live without, the sun, shines right between the city's buildings, and people get excited about it. The name of this New York phenomenon is connected not to Egyptians, but to the people who built Stonehenge, an ancient structure in England that I've examined. There's disagreement about when Stonehenge was built, maybe as early as 1600 BC. But we know with certainty that Stonehenge was built, in large part, to track the sun. I'm glad I got to see people turn out for Manhattan Hinge. But now I need to figure out the mystery behind the three obelisks and why they're placed where they are. Some people may think it's just a coincidence that the Central Park, Emmett, and Worth obelisks are laid out the way they are. Not me. I think there's a reason for their placement in a row just shy of a straight line. And I intend to figure out what it is.
the skyline of New York City was developed over hundreds of years. But three things hidden within it may reveal a forgotten history of the city. My investigation into an old Egyptian obelisk in Central Park has led to a bigger mystery, which involves two other obelisks carefully placed by Freemasons into the layout of the Big Apple. I think the specific locations of these three obelisks could reveal that an ancient Egyptian alignment is present right here in Manhattan. But why? I've asked a friend of mine who's a designer to help me determine why the Freemasons would have placed these obelisks the way they did nearly a hundred years ago. Wow, that is awesome. I tried to put some landmarks just to kind of give you a picture of where things are and, mm -hmm. you know, set up a little atmosphere. You did a great job. Thanks. Empire State Building. That one I know is the Flatiron Building. It's pointing right at the Worth Obelisk. And of course, uh, the Freedom Tower. They're not to scale, but it kind of just gives you an idea of where things are located. Well, what about the obelisks? I have those too. They're much bigger so that you can get some of the detail in them so it doesn't get confusing. Let's pull these off and then we'll pull out the obelisk. Great, let's do it. Here's the first one. Well, this is the real Egyptian obelisk in Central Park, which is right by the Metropolitan Museum of Art, right about there. The Worth Obelisk. Here's the last one. This is the Emmet Obelisk, and this one goes to St. Paul's Chapel right here. Okay, now when you look at this, what does it look like? A line. A straight line. Mm -hmm. That's what I thought. But actually, it's not a straight line. And I want to check that to see if indeed it is off. Why don't we start by marking these three points. Here's St. Paul's mm -hmm. Chapel. Here is the Worth. And then Central Park Egyptian Obelisk. So I have a straight edge here. Perfect. It's off. Yeah, just slightly. We've got three points, and the one that's off is the Worth Obelisk. The question is, why is it not straight? Why does it take this bend? <sighs> Carrie, you know what? That Something just occurred to me. Hold on a sec. I've got some pictures here that I took of New York. This is in Grand Central Station. And when I was in there, I noticed something very unusual. There are a number of constellations that are depicted on the ceiling. And what's unusual about them is they're not depicted as we look up at the stars. They're actually depicted looking down from space or what God would see, except for the stars in Orion. Take a look at these three stars right here. These are the three stars in Orion's belt, and they're not straight. They're almost straight, just like these three obelisks are almost straight. This has got to be a depiction of Orion's belt. So why would anyone spend this much energy recreating Orion's belt in Manhattan? You know what? There is a precedent, and it goes back over 5,000 years. In Egypt, we see the same thing. The Great Pyramids in Giza are laid out like Orion's belt. This was discovered not that long ago. So what's so special about Orion's belt? Well, in Egyptian mythology, Orion symbolized Osiris, the male god. These three stars in Orion's belt point to the star Sirius. Sirius in ancient Egyptian mythology symbolized the goddess Isis. And you know what? If you notice, these three obelisks point out into the harbor at what? The Statue of Liberty. The Statue of Liberty. Mm -hmm. She symbolizes the goddess Isis amongst many other goddesses. So I do think we are onto something here, and I think this is Orion's belt. And this is exactly the type of thing that the Freemasons would do. So really what these three obelisks represent is a piece of Egypt here in Manhattan. The Central Park Obelisk, Manhattan Hinge, Orion's belt, these are all clues that tie to one sacred subject, astronomy. 
It was one of the ancient mysteries taught to the pharaohs in Egypt, but today it is inscribed in nearly every Freemasonic lodge around the world. Understanding the way our world fits within the universe was not only important for ancient cultures, but still holds great importance today. This investigation proves that the bonds between Freemasons and the ancient Egyptians were much stronger than I ever suspected. I wonder if there are other old structures like the Central Park Obelisk holding secrets of our country's past. I'm sure they're out there, and I can't wait to find them. If you have a mysterious artifact or site I need to see, I want to know about it. Go to history.com slash unearthed.